Good morning. How are y'all today? Good. Did y'all have a good night last night? Yes, ma'am. Good night. Did y'all enjoy everything last night? Yes. Were y'all encouraged? Yes. Y'all have all got your t-shirts on, looking so cute. I, those t-shirts are awesome. And y'all gave me one, so thank you very much, because they are stinking awesome. Um, <laughs> let me, there's a couple of things I was supposed to, well, one thing I was supposed to do last night, and I forgot. Um, let me, maybe there's some of you here today that weren't here last night. So let me just introduce myself. Uh, um, my name is Heidi Reisner, and uh, my husband and I are pastors of a church, our Savior's Church in Opelousas, Louisiana. It's kind of the Lafayette, uh, Lafayette, Louisiana uh, region. And then we also help to oversee. We're part of a family of churches of our Savior's Church. And we also help to oversee um, uh, many churches within our family of churches. And so um, it's, a, it's a blessing to be here. I was here last year with you guys. And, and Rebecca and the team, I said last night, just don't they just do an awesome, awesome job. Just so... So y'all are so, so blessed. I hope y'all realize that. Y'all are so blessed to have this uh, team and put these things together because I know what it takes to put something like this on, and it's, it's, it's no easy feat. And so uh, y'all just make sure that you let them know how much you appreciate them. And Rebecca and I were talking about this, and again, this is just, I'm just throwing some nuggets out. It has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk to you about. But um, Rebecca and I were talking today, this morning and we're pastors. My husband and I are pastors, and we've pastored people and pastored churches for uh, 32 years now. And so we've been around the church a lot and have led in a lot of different capacities. And we've never led through a year like we have gone through in 2020. And we talked a little bit about that last night. And this is what we've seen happen and Rebecca and I were talking about it today. And I just want to encourage you in there. I just want to encourage you. Because 2020 was, I don't know, our region was hit really hard with COVID. And we're in an African-American community. And our African-American families were hit very, very badly. We've had many losses and loss of life. And family members have died. And, and it has just been a tragic, tragic situation that we've walked through. So our church was shut down for six months. Never in my entire life. I was born and raised, not, I wasn't born in church, but I was raised in church. <laughs> and I mean, never in my whole life has a church ever shut its doors for six months. I mean, it, it was just unbelievable. And so then you open back up and then people, you know, some are coming back, some are not coming back. And I, I'm sure y'all have sent some of that even here. And, and th this is what I heard a pastor say this uh, last week that was so good. He said, if you're staying home, because of health reasons, then absolutely, please take those precautions. But if you're staying home now out of habit, it's time to get back into God's house. Amen. Because you cannot, and this is what I know for sure, because even Rebecca was asking me, all of our people aren't back yet, and again, for all the different reasons. But, but the ones who can come back it is and we're saying hello to all of our online people i forgot so give them a big wave just turn around wave to them Woo! all of our online people and so though we still have church online and that's a blessing because of technology for those who cannot come it really never takes the place of an in-house gathering with with the people of god and we're seeing on our end you can't be out of church for six months and it not affect you it affects people, and people are walking through hard times, and if ever we've needed the family of God, the spirit of God, the house of God, it, it is now. And so I want to I want to encourage you in this. Y'all are influencers in your homes. You're influencers uh, in the world and the sphere of influence that God has given you. And as you leave this weekend, hopefully, my prayer has been, and we're going to talk about this uh, this morning, my prayer has been that God would just pour courage back into you that's what the word encouragement means it means to pour courage into and that you're so full of courage and so full of encouragement and hope for the future that you leave here and go back to the people that are in your world and there may be some that you know what have gotten into a habit of not being in the house of God for you to go back to them and go you know what all the precautions are being taken we're taking everything very seriously 
but please come back to church with me on Sunday because I promise that your heart and your soul is going to be blessed because of it. Because again, there's so much uncertainty going forward. We don't know what's going to happen. We do know this. God is with us. And he's gone before. So I just want to encourage you in that. Just let, let's really use the influence that God's given us and really speak hope and encouragement to a people and to a world and to a group that's in your life that really, really desperately needs it. Does that make good sense? Okay, I, I was supposed to say this last night and I forgot, so let me just do this real quickly. There's a couple of books that I've written that are over on uh, the tables over there somewhere. And... Uh, one of them is called Redemption. That is a, kind of a study of the book of Ruth. I kind of have woven my personal st testimony and my personal story through that. The second book is called She's In You. And I go through the life of Deborah in the Old Testament. But a lot of what you've heard last night and today is in, is in that book. And so um, just, again, uh, hopefully it's going to be a great encouragement. In both of those books, I put small group discussion questions at the end of each chapter to where you could take those books, go chapter by chapter. In fact, in fact I met one of our little teenage girls and her little table of friends. She's going to take her whole little group through this as a Bible study. You can go chapter by chapter with, with the group discussion and all that. So I encourage you to do that because, again, people are hungry. People are hungry. For God, and they may not even know it's God that they're looking for, but they're so hungry, they're so looking for answers. So, again, we're to be the light of the world, the hope of the world, that Jesus that lives in us. And so, anyway, you can take advantage of those if you want. Um, I do have a website, HeidiReisner.com. On that website, I've got blogs on there. I've got devotions on there. I've got Bible studies, video Bible studies that I've done that you can go on there if you want to. After this weekend, you may not want to. That's fine. But <laughs> maybe you will. And so... Um, over the COVID, kind of the shutdown, the quarantine that we went through, I did a, a, a Bible study, Psalms 23, just went, the Lord is my shepherd. And I did that on video, online, for everyone to tune in, to walk them through just a time that we needed real peace and real comfort. And so that's on the website as well, so you can pull that up if you want. So I was supposed to say that last night, so there you go. Okay, uh, get those groovy, awesome pins out that are at your table, and then get your... Uh, paper out and we're gonna we're gonna hit it today I'm going to um, I'm gonna be giving you a lot of scriptures today so if you have your Bibles get ready <coughs> excuse me if not just make the reference because you're gonna need these scriptures today because the uh, you're gonna need the truth of what God's Word says so I said last night I'm just gonna pick up from last night and we're gonna go into becoming a woman of dignity part two and so last night we talked about Psalm, uh, Psalms, uh, Proverbs 31, the context of that, laying that out, do, do, doing uh, uh, what the context was. Remember we talked about so many, so many oftentimes, so, uh, Psalms, oh, I should not have said Psalms 23. Proverbs 31 oftentimes is set up as a, a standard and a bar that's set so high that none of us could ever jump over it. And so last night, hopefully, I brought that down, hopefully, to some real life to go, you know what, these are some things that I can really aspire to be. So we're going to go back to, to Proverbs 31 this morning, and, um, and I'm going to go back to verse 10, which I read to you last night, but I'm going to read it out of the New King James Version uh, this morning. And we talked about and spent time on this last night, who can find a virtuous wife or a virtuous woman? But I'm going to go to that second part, and that's where we're going to land this morning. Her worth or her value is far above rubies. So we're talking about this woman, this virtuous woman. We talked about last night, remember, is a woman of great strength. A great strength, not someone that just blows whichever way the wind goes and goes whichever way the culture's going, but a woman that has got resolve and strength and ability and might and power, the power of God in her. And then we're going to talk about to this morning her worth and her value is far above rubies. Let me give you a definition of value. This is what it means to value. It means to esteem. It means to hold in respect. Significant or to highly regard. That's the, that's the definition of value. To esteem, to hold in respect, significant, to highly regard. Our worth and our value comes from the character that we possess. Our worth and our value doesn't come from our appearance or the things that we have in our life. Okay, do y'all realize that? 
Because in Proverbs 31, this is what I find so interesting. And I said this last night. This detailed description of what a godly woman, a woman of strength and dignity looks like, and, I mean, and acts like, it has no, there's no description in there. In all those verses that I read last night, there's no description in there whatsoever about her appearance. It doesn't say she's tall with wild curly hair. It doesn't say that doesn't say she's petite with blonde hair. It, doesn't, it has nothing to do with our appearance. The strength and the virtue and the value and the dignity that we're to carry as women has nothing to do with our physical appearance. But the world tells us exactly the opposite, doesn't it? That it's all about our appearance and it's all about the way we look. Are we to put together and do the best we have with what God, God has given us? Of course we are. We're to represent him well. We're to represent Christ well. So I'm not saying you disregard, but the world and the culture that we're in today puts so much value on the outer appearance and no value at all on the inner appearance. And so what God's word does, he comes in and goes, it's exactly the opposite. It's who you are on the inside. It's the character that you possess on the inside. And in doing so, it's going to affect your outside. It's going to affect how we look and our disposition and how we carry ourselves. Just as, and I, and I find it interesting that it also says that our worth and value is far above rubies. It, that God's word compares our value to precious gems. And if I'm not a jeweler, obviously, but... Any kind of jeweler or anybody that knows anything about precious gems will tell you this, that their values increase the more time goes by. And that the Word of God compares our value to precious gems, meaning that our value and our esteem and our worth increases as time goes by. Again, which is exactly the opposite of what our world tells us. That once you hit a certain age, then you're pretty much done. You know, once you hit the certain age, then we, the, the, the world, TV programs, movies, don't have any use for you because you've hit a certain age and then you're of no good. God's word says exactly the opposite. The longer we walk with him and the more we know him and the older we even get in age, the more val our value increases because the more wisdom and the more insight we have of walking with him. So no matter your age in here, and if you are more seasoned, don't listen to the lie of the enemy that says God's done with you. Because he's not. You're more valuable today than you've ever been. Because there's a generation of young women that are looking for a standard and an example to follow. That are looking for role models and mentors. That are looking for someone to show them the way. And if you listen to the lie of the enemy saying that you're done, an entire generation misses out on the wisdom that God's given you. Your value and your worth is far above rubies. Before we can ever carry ourselves as women of dignity, we have to place the same value and worth that God places on us. We have to believe that to be true about ourselves. And I said this last night. When we talk about women of strength and dignity, it's a lot easier to believe the strength part of it. It's not so easy to believe the dignity part of it. Dignity is our self-esteem. It's our self-respect. It's how we see ourselves. And I know women because I am one and because I've worked with and led women for many, many, many years. Most women don't put too, most women that I know that I've walked with don't put too much value on themselves. They put too less value on themselves. That women don't see yourself the way God sees you. You don't see yourself even the way others see you. And so strength may not be the issue. But I promise you, most of you in here, dignity becomes the issue. How you see yourself. The self-worth. The value of something is what someone is willing to pay for it. The value of something is what someone is willing to pay for it. If, um, if, if, if you were in here and you were selling your house, and we heard about a house for sale today, and you <laughs> love your house, you absolutely love it and think it's the greatest thing in the world, and it's so awesome, and you value and you esteem and you love your house, and you put a price tag of $10 million on it because that's how much you love it, 
your house is worth the value of what someone's willing to pay for it. So if someone's not willing to pay $10 million, though in your mind you think it's just the most awesome house, if someone's not willing to pay $10 million, then the value is not $10 million. Does that make sense? Yeah. The value of something, the value of you is worth what someone is willing to pay for it. The most famous verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The value of something is what someone is willing to pay for it. You and I must be pretty valuable because God himself sent his only son to give his life and to die on the cross, to forgive our sins so that we wouldn't have to die for our own sins. That's how valuable you are to God. So the question isn't whether we're valuable to God or not. The question is whether we see ourselves as valuable ourselves. <clears throat> Do we see the strength and the dignity that we're to walk in? Do we see ourselves valuable? Do we see ourselves significant? Do we see ourselves with great self-respect and self-honor? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the enemy of our souls. Hold on, let me grab a cough drop. <clears throat> the enemy of our souls has set out to destroy our self-esteem. <clears throat> There's a real enemy out there. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. <clears throat> There's a real enemy out there. I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm not saying that to frighten you. I'm not saying that to put fear in you. Sorry. I'm just saying that to be honest with you and to talk reality. There are forces of evil that we wrestle with every single day. There's good and evil that are at battle in the spirit realm every single day. There is a real enemy. We are not to be fearful. We are not to be afraid. We are not to cower to that. Because again, the word says that greater is he who lives in us than he that lives in the world. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. We're going to overcome evil because Jesus, the spirit of God, lives in us. But the reality is there's still an enemy. And there's still an enemy that knows exactly where to go in our hearts that can do the most damage. He knows exactly the words and the lies to speak to us as women that will do us the most damage. And he uses media to do it. He uses social media to do it and magazines and TV because all women, <clears throat> all women have to do is look at anything that the world is putting out and that culture is putting out and we'll never, ever measure up to it. Yeah. Ever. Because again, the, 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 the emphasis is on our outward appearance. And you've got to look a certain way, you've got to wear certain clothes, and you've got to carry yourself this, and you've got to have this kind of work done, you've got to do this, you've got to... It, it's a standard that nobody can meet. And you're hearing every time you turn around how you're not valuable enough, how you're not good enough, how you've got to do the next thing or buy the next thing or, or have this next thing done in order to have greater value. And the enemy uses our culture to do it. Every, we're inundated with it. Inundated. Teenage girls that are, are, and young girls that are being uh, grown up in this culture are inundated with it. I don't have to tell you the reports and the statistics, even of what social media can do to these kids and what they see on there and what they're trying to become. And, and, and it, it, the enemy uses every bit of it to come to the bottom line to say, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not valuable enough. You don't have what it takes. You don't look good enough. You don't have, you don't have what you need. Over and over and over, it's the lies of the enemy. And so today, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go through five things, strategies that the enemy will use to destroy your self-esteem. Strategies that the enemy will use to destroy your self-esteem, your self-worth, your dignity, whatever word, all of those are one and the same. And so I'm going to tell you what the lie is. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to show you in God's word what the truth really is. 
Because if you don't believe the truth, you're going to always believe the lie. If you have nothing to combat the lie with, you're going to believe the lie to be true. Okay, are y'all following me? Before I jump into my first, the, the, uh, the first strategy, I want you to go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 21. And this is the Apostle Paul talking, and he's speaking, uh, he's speaking to believers. He's not speaking to unbelievers in this passage. He's not speaking to the lost. He's not speaking to those who don't know God. He's speaking to believers and those who know and walk with God. In verse 21, it says this. For although they knew God, again, believers, Christians, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave him thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Okay, so they didn't give glory and honor to God, didn't give him thanks because their thinking in their minds, had become futile. It had become useless, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And then I want you to go over to verse 25. He's still speaking about believers here. And he says this, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Meaning, here's the word of God, Here's the truth of God, but I don't really believe this. So the enemy, I'm going to lay this down and I'm going to receive the lies of the enemy as if they were true. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So today, that's why I'm going to give you the lie and then I'm going to come back and give you the truth. Because when you walk out of here, the lies of the enemy are still going to come as long as we allow it to come. And if we don't have the word of God and the truth, we have nothing to combat it. And we walk out believing the lies of the enemy as if they were true. Does does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Number one is this, strategy of the enemy to destroy our self-esteem. And these are things that I've wrestled with personally. I didn't just pull these out of the air. These are things that I've had to wrestle with over all the years that I've walked with God. These are things that I've had to wrestle with myself. Number one is this, he will try to attack your identity. The enemy will try to attack your identity. Never before in recent history has there been such an attack on identity. Who we are. Who God created us to be. Never never before. In our recent memory, can I remember a time where identity has been under such attack? Most women, again, don't place too much value on yourselves. You don't place enough value on yourself because of the identity. You think too lowly of yourself. You hear these messages like this and go, this is for everybody else. This is for those girls across the room. This is for that table over there. But she doesn't know what I'm wrestling with and she doesn't know what I'm walking through. This is for every single person in the room. The enemy will try to attack your very identity, your very purpose of why God created you. He will attack everything about who you are and who God created you to be. And I can give you an example of it. Matthew chapter 3. Flip over there if you have your Bibles. Matthew chapter 3, and it's at the end of... um, it was, it's at the end of uh, chapter 3 in Matthew. And let me set this up quickly. This was John the Baptist. He was coming and preparing the way for Jesus. Jesus comes. John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus, the Son of God. Born of a virgin, Jesus Christ was coming in and beginning his very ministry. And in Matthew chapter 6, beginning, I mean, Matthew chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 16, John the Baptist was, was baptizing Jesus. And it says this in verse 16. Jesus hadn't even started his ministry yet. This was the beginning. This was the beginning of the ministry Jesus was about to have. And it says this. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. At that moment, imagine. Y'all do baptisms here? Y'all have baptisms? There it is, right there. Okay, baptism. You have your baptism. He came up out of the water at the moment that John the Baptist brings Jesus out of the water. 
heaven opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Okay, imagine if you were being water baptized. And your pastor or your leader, whoever's baptizing you, brings you up out of the water. Heaven itself opens. Doves are flying. God's voice booms from heaven and says, This is my daughter who I love so much and who I am so pleased with. I mean, can, can you even imagine? This is a pause. This is another message for another day. God speaks about how much he loves Jesus, how much he uh, uh, values Jesus, how pleased he is with Jesus before Jesus ever did one thing. Jesus didn't have to perform anything to get the love and acceptance of his heavenly father. You don't have to perform anything. You don't have, it's not your works that causes God to love you. Before Jesus ever did one thing, the approval and the love of his, heaven, of, of his father came. And so it is with us. So imagine that scene, that baptism scene. Then go immediately into chapter 4. Sometimes because the Bible is broken up in chapters, we end that chapter and then we close that down like that's a separate event and we start a new chapter like that's a whole brand new event. But it's not. Jesus is baptized. Heaven opens. God speaks. He's love and well, he's, he loves him and he's well pleased. Then it says in this chapter 4 verse 1, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I put a smiley face in my Bible right there. Because if you're going to fast 40 days and 40 nights, I don't care if you are Jesus, you are going to be hungry. So you can put a little smiley face right there. <laughs> Verse 3, the tempter came to him, the enemy, and said, I'm just telling y'all, get this picture. Jesus is baptized. John the Baptist brings him up. Heaven opens. Doves fly. God speaks. This is my son who I love and I'm well pleased. That's, pretty, that's some pretty significant validation, don't you think? Then Jesus was led to the, the desert to be tempted by the devil. The tempter came to him and said this, If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you're really the son of God. Now, heaven had just opened, and God himself had just spoken. This is my son who I love and who I'm well pleased with. God himself said that over Jesus. And the enemy takes Jesus to a deserted place, to a wilderness season, and the very first words he says, if you are the son of God. The enemy's strategy is to ta attack your very identity. And if he's going to do that with Jesus when it was so clear and so pronounced as to what God had just said, don't you think for a minute that he won't attack our identity? The enemy always comes asking questions. He'll always question what God has already, already spoken to you. You're going to come out of a weekend like this and you're going to hear the Spirit of God speak some things to you. You're going to hear God's voice speak to you. You're going to know it's God. You're going to know it's heaven speaking to your heart. You're going to walk out of here so hopeful and so encouraged, so full of strength and dignity. You're walking out of here and going, they better watch out out there because I'm a woman of strength and dignity. I've got a t-shirt to prove it, and I'm going to walk in it. <laughs> and as soon as you walk out of here, you're going to get in your car, you're going to get home, or you're going to get to your workplace, you're going to go to Walmart, and the enemy's very first thing, are you really a woman of strength and dignity? A woman of strength and dignity wouldn't have said what you just said. A woman of dignity wouldn't have thought what you just thought. Are you really? Did God really say? Did God really speak to you? The enemy will always question what God has already spoken to you. He's going to attack your very identity. He's going to speak lies that question your salvation, your, work, your walk with God, your value and your worth. 
He's going to bombard you with the questions that can be tormenting in your mind. And if you don't know the truth of God's word, you're going to succumb to those lies instead of rising up as a woman of strength and dignity and going, get behind me, Satan, just like Jesus did. And he rebukes him with the word of God. That's why the word of God is so important. You can't just come to church on Sunday or come to a conference like this and hear a few verses and expect that to hold you over to next week. You have got to read God's word for yourself. You've got to open up the Bible and read it for yourself. You've got to meditate on it. You've got to pray over it. You've got to meditate on it. You've got to get it in your heart and mind because the enemy is busy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, bombarding us with lies, and we have to know the truth of God's word to come against the lies. He's going to attack your identity, and this is what the truth is. The truth is John chapter 1, verse 12. When the lies of the enemy are, are you really saved? Are you really a child of God? Does God really love you? You've done too many bad things for God to love you. John chapter 1 verse 12 says this, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, daughters of God. To those who received him, And who believed on his name. That the God of heaven gave us the right to become children, daughters of God. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's your identity. And don't you allow the lies of the enemy to tell you any different. Because if you believe that and you really know that to be true, you're going to act differently. You're going to walk differently. You're going to behave differently. You're going to speak differently. And you're not going to let another person or a lie of the enemy tell you any less than that. God loves you. He's not mad at you. My husband says this all the time. God is not mad at you. And we walk around as Christians like God is in heaven with a jackhammer ready to knock our whole head off. God's not mad at you. He loves you. He knows how messed up you are. He knows how messed up I am. But in spite of our failures and in spite of of our mistakes, we're all human. God still loves us so much. He's not mad at you. God knows who you are and what you can become and what, how he made you and what you're capable of. He's just waiting for you to start to believe it. Because once you start believing it, then everybody ought to watch out because that's a powerful woman that is full of the strength of God, full of the strength of, and dignity of God, and walk out of here believing what God's really said about her. Yes. He's going to attack a strategy of the enemy. He's going to attack your identity. Number two is this, another strategy. The enemy will use is comparison. He will use comparison. And again, these are not just good ideas I pulled out of the air. I know this because I've walked through this. I know what I've had to wrestle with. I know what I've had to overcome. I know what I've had to learn. And comparison was a big deal. And I think for every woman, I I think for most women, comparison is an issue that we wrestle with that we probably don't want to even admit that we do. Because most of all this, girls, and everything I'm going to talk to you about this morning, it all goes on inside of our head. Most of us are smart enough to not say it out of our mouth and let the whole world know how messed up we really are. We're going to pull it together. The battle's in our head. And the battle is the conversations that we have with the enemy in our head, and we have no idea it's the enemy that we're talking to. Comparison. He uses comparison. The enemy's strategy to destroy our self-worth is to have us compare ourselves with other women. You want to destroy your dignity and destroy your self-worth? Start comparing yourself to other people. Now, there's a difference between admiring and respecting other women versus comparing yourself to them. Okay, so don't get mixed up in that. 
We are to admire and respect women that God puts in our life for us to aspire to become some of the values and attributes that they carry. We can aspire and respect it and want to become that ourselves. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about comparing ourselves. Comparing ourselves. And this is what happens. This is what happens when we compare. If you compare yourself, again, this goes on in your head. We are tricky. Oh, we're sly. We, we are so good. We compare ourselves with another girl. And it's probably even happened here this weekend. Though no one's going to ever say that. So <laughs> someone's going to come in and you're going to be scoping the crowd out. And you're going to be looking around. And, and you're going to find somebody that's not quite as cute as you are. That's probably not dressed as cute as you are. They don't have it together quite as much as you do. And you're going to compare yourself. And you're going you're to find someone that you're better than in your own head. And when you compare yourself and you're better than that person, that opens up the door for pride. This comparison thing. So secretly you're comparing yourself and you're going to find somebody that doesn't measure up to you so you think to make yourself feel better and it opens up the, your heart to pride coming in. Or you're going to compare yourself with somebody secretly and you're going to find somebody you're kind of equal to. You know what? She's not really a 10 and neither am I, but I'm probably <laughs> on a good day, probably a five and a half. And so, you know, she's probably a five. She, on a good day, she's probably a five and a half. So you know what? I can kind of hang with her because we're, we're kind of we're equal to one another. When you do that, you open your heart up. You open your heart up to being competitive. There's this competitive thing comes in. Here's this girl that's about the same range as you are. Watching her. What is she saying? How is she walking? What does she look like? Good hair day, not good hair day. Let's see. My shoes are cuter than hers today. Tomorrow, maybe not. Got to go make sure I find a cuter pair so I win every day on this. Okay. Then there's this thing that comes in and it becomes competitive. Again, it's all in our heads. Then, on our days that we don't feel so strong, we start comparing ourselves to other women, and we find that we're less than them. I can never measure up to that. I can never be that. I can never look like that. I can never have a family like that. I could never have a home like that. I could never speak like that. You're going to start comparing yourself to people that you're going to be less than. Then it opens your heart up to insecurity. And insecurity comes in, and then you're overtaken and eaten up with insecurities. So all those scenarios I just gave you, none of those are good. Whether it's pride that comes in, whether it's competitiveness that comes in, or whether it's insecurity that comes in, not, the, point of this, the, the point of that is nothing good ever comes out of comparison. Right. Nothing. Because God made you wonderfully and he made you uniquely. And if we go around trying to compare ourselves with other people, there's not another human being on the planet Earth that's made exactly like you. And it's a losing battle because you're not going to be able to find her because God so uniquely and wonderfully made you. And in fact, the lie of comparison that comes in our mind, the truth is in Psalms 139 that you, you know this verse, Psalms 139, 14 says this, I praise you, God, because I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. That God so uniquely made you. He so wonderfully made you. That there's no one else on the planet that has your DNA, that has your fingerprints, that is exactly like you are. That's why the comparison is of the enemy. It's not God because there is no one compared to who you are. I want to ask you this question. When was the last time, and I want you to be honest, when was the last time you gave thanks to God for how you were made? When was the last time you looked in the mirror and instead of shredding yourself to pieces from all angles, you looked in that mirror and you go, God, I'm going to give you praise because I am fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Thank you, God, that you made me 5'9". Thank you, God, that you gave me 
hair that looks like I stuck my finger in a light socket. I love her hair. Thank you, God, and be, for the giftings you've given me. Thank you for the personality you've given me. Thank you, God. Okay, when was the last time you honestly told God thank you for how he created you? And if the answer is never, and if the answer is almost never, what does that say to the creator who so perfectly puts you together? God, thank you. It's not being prideful. It's being thankful. Because it, it, we know it had nothing to do with us. I didn't get to choose what I look like. I didn't get to choose my personality. I didn't get to choose... Now, there's things that I work on, and there's characteristics and character that I want to be formed more like Jesus every day, so I have a responsibility. But all those things I didn't have control over. That God put me together exactly the way he wanted me to be put together. And as we get older and more seasoned, things start happening to us. And things start going different directions on us and start getting a little bit more round on us. And, 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 and stuff starts happening when you hit a certain age and you have to go to the beauty shop more often because gray hairs are coming in like nobody's business. And, and you, okay, we're still fearfully and we're wonderfully made. When was the last time you gave thanks to God for you? Number three is this. Strategy of the enemy is through insignificance. Through insignificance. Remember I read the definition of value to you earlier. And one of, the, one of the words for value was significant. The enemy will use insignificance to destroy our self-esteem and our dignity. He will attack us with an overwhelming sense of insignificance. This is something that I wrestle with, especially in the early days. When Eugene and I were married... We've been married, thir fixing me 32 years, and actually just a couple of weeks, 32 years. So I was 21 when we got married. And y'all do the math right there on the paper, then you can see the age. <laughs> Don't even care. I have no problem getting old, I promise you. I really don't. But I just lost my train of thought. That's the part of getting old, sorry. <laughs> oh, 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 I've lost it. <laughs> I don't have a problem getting old, except when I can't remember the next thing I was going to say. <laughs> Insignificance early on. When, I, we were, when we were married, and I was a young pastor's wife, and then I really, as time went by, I knew God was putting this calling in me. I knew he was asking me to lead women. I knew what he was asking of me. And this overwhelming wave of insignificance and unworthiness just, just rush over me to go, Heidi, you don't know enough. You don't know the Bible enough. You're not smart enough. You didn't come from the right family. You can't speak well. You got too strong of an accent. People aren't going to listen to you. Da, da 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 This insignificance that I would wrestle with and wrestle with and wrestle with that would keep me held back from doing what God had asked me to do. And I finally had to get to the point in my life to go, God, I know what you've asked me to do, and I knew you, you know all these things about me already. So you must see something in me that I don't see myself, and this is not a point now. This, the point now is whether I'm going to be obedient or not whether I'm going to push aside the insignificance and be obedient to what you've asked me to do, because if I don't, it's disobedient, and it means you don't really know what you're talking about, is really what I'm saying back to God. The insignificance, the value that God's placed on us is significant. He knows who you are. He knows your mistakes. He knows your past history. He knows the sins that are, that are, that, that's in your life. God knows that. And in spite of that, he still wants to use you. In spite of that, he still wants to do a work in you. Because there's people in your life that you're going to reach that nobody else can reach. That's what makes you significant. It's not because of who we are. It's because of who he is in us that makes us significant. We are significant because we're valued. Let me tell you, that's the lie of the enemy is the insignificance. But here's the truth. The truth is this, Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God knew you before you were ever formed in the womb. 
God knew you and knew the calling and the purpose he was going to have for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11, familiar verses. I know the plans for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. There's a plan that God has for your life that he already knows. We've got to submit to that and recognize that we're significant enough to walk that out. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, more truth. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's already prepared in advance what he has you to do and how you are to walk. And we are his workmanship that he's put together uniquely and wonderfully to serve the purposes to which he created us to be. Number four, another strategy of the enemy is unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations. And I talked about this last night about Proverbs 31. And all those verses about the virtuous woman can be so unattainable and so unrealistic that we just throw it all out and say, forget it. The enemy will try to come in and put such unrealistic expectations in our minds for us to carry weight and responsibility that we were never intended to carry. I know this to be true because I walked in this for a long time. And women are the world's worst. Again, like I said, we'll do stuff for everybody else. We'll tend to everybody else. We're always the last one on the list to tend to and care for. And then we put these, allow these unrealistic expectations to come on us. And we carry weight and we carry responsibility and we've got to fix this person and we've got to fix this one and we've got to do this and we've got to fix this. And we carry this weight on us. And this is, the le- this is what I've learned over the years of doing this the wrong way. That 90% of the weight and the responsibility that I've carried is I've put it on myself. No one else has put it on me. Not even God. That I'm the world's worst and just packing stuff on me. Packing stuff, packing stuff, packing stuff. I can do it. I can do it. We're superhero. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. And then at the end of the day, we're absolutely crushed and wonder why we're breaking down under pressure. It's because we are carrying weight and carrying responsibility that not even God himself asked us to carry. Am I the only one in this whole room that's done that? Let me give you the truth. Let me give you the truth. Of what these unrealistic, unrealistic expectations look like. It is in Matthew chapter 11. And it's verse 28 through 30. And this is Jesus. These are, again, familiar verses. This is Jesus speaking to us. And he says this. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we read those verses and we go, yeah, that's wonderful. That sounds great. Awesome. Happy for everybody else. But Jesus says, come to me. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. I'm going to explain a yoke very quickly. But you girls at Cowboy Fellowship should already know this. A yoke is what ranchers put on horses or cattle around their neck with a plow behind, especially in the old days, to plow up ground. It was a heavy yoke, but they could manage it. And they would, they would do their work using this, the cattle or horses to have this yoke upon them to pull the plow that needed to be done. Two are always better than one, it says in Ecclesiastes. So one horse or one cow can pull this plow and do the work. But if you yoke them up two by two, they're going to get more work done. And it's going to be less, less weight on those animals if they're yoked up two by two. What Jesus was saying is this. He didn't say, take that yoke off. It's too heavy. 
He didn't say, throw that down. You're not going to have any weight. You're going to have no responsibility. You're not going to have to worry about any problems or any burdens or anything in this world. You're not going to have any worries in the world. Jesus did not say that. He said, if you're tired and you're weary, I want you to take my yoke upon you. Meaning, I want you to yoke up next to me. Because if you're tired and you're weary and the weight's too heavy to carry, and the responsibility and the cares of this world is too heavy for you, it means that you're trying to carry it on your own, and you're not yoking up next to Jesus. Jesus says, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And if we're crushed under the weight of what this world brings to us on a daily, a daily basis, it simply means that we haven't yoked up to Him. We're not going to not have a yoke, we're not going to not have problems and burdens and cares because we live in a fallen world. We're not going to be free from all that until the day we get to heaven. But in the meantime, Jesus is saying, don't carry it alone. Don't carry it by yourself. I have a yoke that's going to be easy and I have a burden that's going to be light because I'm going to come right next to you and I'm going to carry it with you because if you try to carry it yourself, it's going to crush you. And girls, I just want to be honest with y'all. There's a lot of you in this room that are feeling crushed to death. The cares of the world, what's going on in our world, what's going on in your families, what you're having to face on a daily basis, it is about to crush you to death is what it feels like. And I want to use Jesus' words when he says, would you come to me? Would you yoke up next to him? And would you relinquish and go, God, I can't carry this anymore. It's crushing me to death. I need to yoke up next to you, God, because your shoulders can handle what mine cannot. You can carry and bear the weight that I cannot. And if I'm buckling underneath it, it means I'm not yoked up next to him. Some of you today, Need to yoke up next to him. Doesn't mean leave you, doesn't mean you do, don't love God. Doesn't believe you're not, doesn't mean you're not a Christian and you don't love him. You try to do it on your own. And the single yoke you're carrying is too heavy for you to carry. There's a yoke. And there's a person that he wants you to yoke up with, and his name is Jesus. And he can help you carry what's been crushing your shoulders. Number five is this. I'm going to have the worship team come back. Because I w I'm going to finish with number five. And then I, I want to go into a time of prayer. And then I'm going to have them lead us in, in, in a song that they sang earlier this morning. Because I really feel this, girls. I really feel this in my heart. Some of you are crushed under the weight of what this last year has been, what this season of life has been, what the lies of the enemy have been. And the Spirit of God brought you here on purpose with a purpose. It's not by happenstance. It's not by coincidence that you got invited to come. It's not by coincidence that you just wanted to get out of the house and, oh, Cowboy Church is a good place for me to be, so let me end up there. He brought you here for a reason. Because it was something that he needed you to know. That you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to walk alone. You don't have to carry it alone. That he sees you right where you're at. He knows the weight and the responsibility that you've had to carry. And though no one else may have seen it, his eyes have seen he knows the lies of the enemy that have bombarded you. And he knows the lies of the enemy that have tormented your mind. And he brought you here today to let you know that his spirit and his power is going to break those lies over you in the name of Jesus. Number five is this, and I'm wrapping up. The enemy's strategy is to bring discouragement. If the enemy can keep you so discouraged, you'll never walk fully in what God has for you. 
If the enemy can keep you so discouraged, you'll always see the glass half empty. You'll never see it half full. If the enemy can keep you discouraged, you're going to always be looking inward and what's wrong with you instead of looking upward and seeing everything that's right with him. Discouragement. Discouragement is a powerful feeling and emotion, isn't it? It can come in waves and at times just feel like it overtakes you. The word discourage actually means the absence of courage. Discourage. It's the absence of courage. It's the absence of strength. It's the absence of dignity. Discouragement. Discouragement keeps our eyes cast down on our problems, on our concerns, and on the worries of this world. Discouragement, your eyes are cast down. Encouragement is when we allow our eyes to be lifted up to see where our help really does come from, to see the one who really is in control of it all. That God's not shaking in his boots, in his cowboy boots in heaven, and going, oh my word, COVID, what's going to happen? Oh my word, the church is shut down, what's going to happen? Oh my word, the whole world's turned upside down, what's going to happen? Okay, God's not pushing the panic button just for you to know. Though everybody in here may be pushing the panic button, God himself is not. And encouragement, pouring courage in, means that we get our eyes off of the cares and worries of this world and we look our eyes up to see who's really in control and that brings great courage to our hearts. Psalms, 120, Psalms 121 says this, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I lift my eyes up. For any of you in here who are mamas, grandmothers, have been around small children, when all the, the little toddlers are little small children, and you need them to listen to you, and you need them to hear what you're saying, you'll reach down and put your hand on their chin and go look up here at mama. Is that true? Look up here at Mama. Look up here at Auntie. No, no, no. Look, because they're going to be going, no, 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 no. I need you to listen to me. Lift up that chin. I want you to feel the hand of God this morning. And you're going, what, 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 what? No, no, no. And I want you to feel the hand of God this morning grabbing your chin and going, sweetheart, look up here. Look up here into my eyes. Look up and listen to what I'm trying to tell you. Listen to the truth that I'm trying to speak to you. I lift up my eyes to see where my help comes from. My help comes from the maker of all of heaven and all of earth. Isaiah chapter 66 says this. It says, this is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Heaven is my home, and the earth is my footstool. When you think the world's spinning out of control, and you think your problems are mounting higher and higher than you can keep up with, I want you to keep that visual in your mind. When discouragement is trying to overtake you every single day, I want you to lift your eyes up, and I want you to visualize God saying, heaven is my home, is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Heaven is my throne. The earth, the entire earth is my footstool. And don't you think for a second that he's not fully in control of all the craziness that's happening out there? And all the craziness that may be happening in here. He is the maker of heaven and earth. 
There is nothing that he's not working on on your behalf. There is nothing that he's not involved with on your behalf. There is nothing that you've walked through or experiencing that his eyes do not see and his heart is not touched. The maker of heaven and earth, sweetheart, lift up your eyes and see what he's trying to tell you. Stop believing the lies of the enemy. Stop exchanging the truth for a lie. Stop believing the lies of the enemy as if they were true. And start believing what God's word and his voice says about you. You are a woman of strength and dignity. You are a woman of great value because of the king of heaven sent his only begotten son to die for you because that's how valuable you are and he is simply waiting for you to believe that and for you to live like that and to see the value of who you really are I want you to stand to your feet and girls let me just say this I've got a plane to catch I've so enjoyed my time here. God is here. His spirit is in this room. And he didn't bring you here for you not to walk out of here changed and different than what you walked in here with. And I don't know if you feel comfortable with this or not. And if you don't, it's totally okay. But if you feel comfortable, I just want you to lift your hands up to the Lord. And I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to pray that the Spirit of God come today and break every lie and every demonic attack that you've wrestled with in your heart and mind. Every insignificance and unworthiness and discouragement and comparison. We're going to break that in the name of Jesus. And as I finish that prayer, Josiah and the team are going to lead you back in that song of blessing. Those are the words. Those are the words out of the book of the, out of the word of God. Those are the words bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you. That's the word of God speaking over you as his daughter. The valuable, dignified, full of strength, full of power, woman of God that you are. And as they sing this song at the end of my prayer, and as you sing that song to God, I want you to receive those words as God's hand lifting your chin up and going, let me tell you how awesome and how significant and how valuable you really are. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your presence that's here today. Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is here. And that, God, we feel your presence. And, God, I know you're walking among these women. And I know you're touching their hearts, God. And I know, God, that you're opening their eyes. Because so many of them have believed the lie of the enemy for so long. They believed it to be true. And today I pray, God, that you've torn the blinders off their eyes and that they're seeing many for the first time, God. They believed lies thinking it was truth. And so, Father, today I pray and I, in the name of Jesus, I break every lie, every demonic attack, every lie that has been spoken over these women in their hearts and mind, God. I break it in Jesus' name. The enemy has no power. He has no authority. And we break those lies in the name of Jesus. We break them over our hearts and over our minds in Jesus' name. These women are not insignificant. They are not unworthy. They are not not valuable, God. They're exactly the opposite. And so, God, as we break the lies of the enemy, now I speak the truth of who they are over them. God, these are women of full of strength, full of your power and full of your might. These are women that are full of dignity and self-esteem and self-worth. These are women that are going to respect themselves and believe the truth, the true words that you speak over them, God, that they are significant. They are worthy, God. They are so valuable that you sent your son to die for them, Father. And I pray, God, they would lift up their eyes this morning and they would see where their help comes from. They would release the weight and the responsibility and the pressure they've carried and that, God, they would 
see, Jesus, that you're in control of it all. And there's nothing that they're going to walk through that you're not going to give them the strength and the wherewithal to walk through. It. That, God, nothing takes you by surprise. That, God, they're going to be blessed and they're coming and they're going. That, God, you honor and you pour out your spirit over them, Jesus. You've got a purpose and a plan for their life, God. Their days ahead are going to be greater ahead, forward than they are behind them. That, God, you're going to anoint them for the season that they are to walk in and the calling to which you have called upon their life. Father, I pray your spirit would come and they would begin to believe what you say about them. That you, they would begin to believe what your word says about them. Jesus, come today. Seal this word in their hearts. Seal this word in their heart, Jesus. Let them declare with their mouth how blessed and how honored and how valued they are. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen.